This is Morgan with the U.S. Ukraine Business Council, Washington, D.C. We welcome all of you to this webinar today on a very, very important subject. As everybody knows, ever since Ukraine became independent, we've been talking about energy, energy and more energy and energy and energy has been a topic it's been a topic for uh, discussions, webinars, uh, op-eds, uh, an endless number. The U.S.-Ukraine Business Council was formed in 1995 in Washington, D.C. A guy by the name of Kuchma, who was running for president, came to Washington, wanted to meet with some business people. There were about 10, 12, 15 businesses already involved in Ukraine, so they got together and formed the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. So we've been working ever since to promote the economic development of Ukraine, to help Ukraine be a better and easier place to do business and to support the business activities of our members. We now have over 200 members and that makes us the largest to private for Ukraine only trade association in the world. And we do operate also out of Kiev. Of course, the pandemic and Putin's invasion has changed so much uh, for the worse. And we're all fighting for the future of Ukraine, fighting to throw out Mr. Putin and help Ukraine move into the future. One area that's very important, of course, is energy. As all of you know, there's been a debate about monopolies in energy. There's been a debate about is Ukraine Ukraine is producing enough. Ukraine can, should be able to produce more. It should not be hard. There should be more coming out. They should be more integrated into the world. They should be doing shale gas. They should be uh, opening up more production sharing agreements. We have to say there's not one major U.S. energy company involved in Ukraine, not because they didn't want to be, but because it was never possible to get a business deal that made sense to them. And so they've all been there and they've all left. Two of the people who have been out front commenting on all these issues for years has been my good friend, Errol Cohen. When I uh, started uh, around 2000, 2001, going to all the think tanks in town to find out if anybody had Ukraine on their business card. Number one, I found nobody had Ukraine on their business card. They all had uh, the CIS, they all had uh, Eurasia, they had Russia and the rest of the world, et cetera, et cetera. But when I ran into Errol, at least I found a guy who was interested in Ukraine. He has Ukraine heritage and uh, he knew a lot about Ukraine. So we established the friendship and been working ever since. And Errol then was with uh, the Heritage Foundation and he's, uh, been a private consultant and running his own firm, making lots of speeches, writing a lot of op-eds, and he's now with the International Tax and Investment Center and also a non-resident uh, fellow at uh, the Atlantic Council. Andre Impolkup has uh, a great background and great education. He's been with this uh, in interesting Ukraine organization, Ukrainian Institute for the Future. So. We're always interested in the future, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, based on on the on the past. So Adrian has a PhD, and and uh, we uh, he's written a lot of op eds too. So we have two of the main uh, out front people who are commenting on the president issues, commenting on what needs to be done, commenting what needs to be done to uh, to set back Russia more, and. Uh, this is a hot topic. So we're gonna start with Ariel. And Ariel, we might start with uh, what you think some of the uh, most uh, prevalent, uh, most interesting, uh, hottest topics are of the day. Uh, and then we'll go into some history and then go to the future. Uh, there's lots of talk now because of the war. There's articles every day about it. What's Ukraine gonna do with Poland? What's Ukraine going to do with Eastern Europe? Uh, what can they do to to uh, provide more energy for themselves? 
what can we do to stop the supply of uh, Russian energy going places where we would rather not go or stop their income flow from energy? So there's all kinds of hot issues. You mentioned we'll try to cover the waterfront with reform and integration, investment, nuclear reactors, LNG, shale. And one, several people wrote me and said we should have put renewables on there. So we got a lot to talk about. So Errol, it's all yours. Uh, we appreciate you helping put this together and uh, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Morgan. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you for the last several decades. Uh, horrible to say that, but time sure flies. Uh, you are doing a terrific job with limited resources promoting the Ukraine business. I admire your work and the council's work. You always have terrific people uh, on board. I also want to thank Nadia for uh, putting it all together. Um, I uh, was working on uh, Ukraine um, energy subjects before the invasion. And while there were a lot of problems, uh, there were problems with the grid, Ukrainian grid uh, in terms of its reliability was behind the indicators that Poland, uh, let's say 20, 30 years ago, Poland and Ukraine had about the same reliability. Uh, now Poland has 10 times more reliable grid than Ukraine did before the last invasion. Um, the, there was a, a progress on renewables uh, because Ukraine wanted uh, to join the EU. It uh, indicated in terms of policy that it's serious about the renewables. The growth of renewables uh, was impressive, although, um, you know, bang for the buck, uh, of course, gas uh, and nuclear are cheaper than renewables and they're more reliable in terms of providing what we call in the business the base load. Uh, but with the invasion, everything changed. Now, Russia, in my opinion, is committing war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity by destroying deliberately and systematically the Ukrainian grid. It is doing it in order to uh, cause maximum suffering, to cause depopulation of Ukraine. And in my opinion, there's too little uh, debate and discussion about that uh, war strategy of Russia's. Um, I do believe that they're violating a whole bunch of articles uh, of the international law. I do not practice uh, public international law, so I'll leave it uh, to the lawyers to uh, give us chapter words, uh, and verse. But uh, I will uh, further on uh, talk about something that I particularly feel strongly about, and that is uh, how they're violating um, the Geneva Conventions Protocols 1 and 2 uh, in terms of the nuclear power. But let me step back and take a look at the macroeconomic uh, picture, uh, which is grim uh, for now. And uh, let me also say, uh, I, I do a lot of energy work, but my sort of background is uh, first legal and then political science. And um, as a scholar of international relations, I can tell you that the ultimate uh, decision about the direction of this war will be in the battlefield. It's not going to be the European, the European Union making this de decision or that decision about reconstruction. That will come later. But for now, uh, we uh, hope and pray that uh, ZSEU, the Ukrainian Defense Forces, uh, will uh, this spring and summer uh, defeat the Russians in the field in such a way that the future uh, agreement that will come, uh, and it will come sooner or later, will be such that the Ukrainian uh, people will uh, stand with their uh, heads high and uh, will be proud to be Ukrainians because anything else um, will uh, make this conflict even more protracted and um, the Russians uh, need to um, be taught a lesson that will prevent the next iteration. Because what the Russia, the Russian uh, president and the Russian government are interested in now is not a real peace, is not recognition of Ukrainian independence and definitely not a recognition of Ukrainian independence 
in the context of the West, in the context of the EU and NATO. They deny Ukrainians in a very, you can say, genocidal way, uh, the right to exist as an independent people, the right to exist as an independent people. And that's why I am shocked when politicians in this country, um, on the far right, and in some cases on the far left and in between, uh, the so-called realists, self-proclaimed realists, uh, say, oh, we just need a compromise with Russia. So if Ukraine uh, loses some territory, so be it. They don't care about it. Of course they don't, but the Ukrainians do. And um, economic issues, energy issues will come secondary to the security issues. You saw the reports of the uh, chairman of China, Xi Jinping. Uh, Ch chairman of China is a real title. He just got it. Uh, visiting Moscow on the 21st of March, um, coming with this very amorphous, undefined uh, peace plan for Russia and Ukraine. Um, I doubt very much from what was made public that this is really a workable uh, peace plan. Uh, and, and I say peace, not ceasefire. Because when they're, they're talking about freezing the line of conflict, they're not talking about territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine uh, in the borders of 1991, not even in the ceasefire lines of 2022. They're talking about freezing it and then negotiating. That raises questions about Ukrainian security of shipment in the Black Sea that raises questions about the Sea of Azov, that Russia openly said it now became an internal Russian sea. Uh, it raises questions about um, the corridor to the Crimea. Um, it is unlikely that Ukraine, as it is constituted today, would be accepting it. And then there's a whole slew of issues of security, NATO membership, EU membership, that Moscow was opposing all along and that triggered uh, the war of 2014. The war of 2014 was not about protecting Russians in the Donbass. It was about preventing Ukrainian people from deciding where the future lies and it, they decided it lies in the West. Uh, so more specifically about the economic situation and the energy situation, you know that the inflation peaked close to 30%. Now it beginning. it's beginning to come down. Um, the uh, Central Bank of Ukraine uh, took an aggressive stance, uh, pushed a lot of money into the system. Uh, they provided loans, including the energy sector loans for people to buy um, generators, which are necessary. Um, the Ukrainian government um, has now a, the biggest trade deficit in history with um, $5 billion uh, a month um, um, imports and $3.8 uh, billion, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, five, $5 billion a, a month imports and $3 billion a month um, exports, um, inflation in the food sector, which is vital for people's survival is very high. The international economic institutions were generous, freezing the debt repayments. However, um, in terms of private, the private sector, some uh, lenders were not so generous and tried to uh, go for courts for enforcement of the existing conditions, disregarding the fact that this is a force majeure and uh, businesses just cannot, cannot produce uh, enough cash flow to pay back uh, the lending. Um, the public debt is climbing. It will take years and years to repay it. Um, the business sector, as I said, is boosted by the government, but losing um, markets, losing manpower, losing electricity, uh, sometimes losing physical plant, uh, it is very difficult to continue the production. That's why I said the military uh, and security solutions need to come first. 
and then the economic rebuilding, uh, which I will talk about in a moment when we start. Um, so the GDP uh, shrunk uh, in the neighborhood of 40% year on year. If you look at the fall of 22, 21 to 22, 40% decline. Um, and uh, some of the largest um, plants, uh, ArcelorMittal Arcelor and Kriverich, as a Paris style, um, either stopped or reduced very, very much uh, their production. Um, in terms of the energy sector, I think probably the most important thing, and uh, Adrian will correct me if this was already resolved, but when I was preparing this presentation, uh, we were talking about generators, uh, bringing generators, especially the big generators uh, that cost uh, two to four million dollars each uh, was a challenge. There was just not enough uh, stock and production capacity in the world to bring them. It, they're multi-ton, the hundreds of tons uh, weight, so it's uh, difficult to transport them on railroads. Um, so that was a challenge. Um, and then there's a discussion um, about um, restoring the grid uh, during bombing, restoring um, generating capacity. Um, it is difficult to restore. Generating capacity may take months and months to restore. Grid is a little bit easier provided you have all the components such as generators. Um, and then um, I would uh, also um, focus on the situation with the nuclear reactors. Um, I do believe that this is a test case that goes beyond Ukraine. It has a global significance because the Russians did not leave the reactors alone, they overran them, they took control of them, they put troops in them, and then they start screaming when the Ukrainians are returning fire uh, at the sources of fire that originates from these reactors. So the Russians are violating Geneva Convention Protocol 1 and 2, um, which talks about uh, standards of conduct. Um, and um, as early as 1956, the Red Cross uh, proposed the immunity from attacks on its installations. It talks about dangerous um, forces and <laughs> nuclear is probably one of the most dangerous force uh, that we are aware of. And if the reactors are not um, uh, demilitarized entirely and left alone. Um, number one, horrible accidents can happen, up to and including the meltdown of the reactors. The Ukrainian reactors beyond, uh, beyond Chernobyl are uh, more modern, have contained structures. There's somewhat less of a chance of a meltdown, but it exists. And uh, one of the uh, factors is the security uh, and availability of personnel. However, if the Russian troops are coming and personnel runs and abandons these reactors because they are unsafe or personnel is exhausted and stressed by the hostilities, by the artillery fire, or small arms fire, can't sleep and then goes to their shift they may make mistakes that can be catastrophic. So IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, was involved, is involved, but it's only um, a limited power that they have, and there's no miraculous solutions if the Russians decide that they're going to violate the international law and endanger their own troops, as well as the Ukrainian population and the staff of these um, nuclear power stations. Uh, as I said, number one, horrible disasters may happen in Ukraine, but number two, this endangers the nuclear, the future of the nuclear industry altogether. And we don't want that. We don't, when we are proclaiming our goal as decarbonization of cutting CO2 emissions, 
there is no other industry uh, besides nuclear that can solve this in an affordable, reliable, and abundant way of supply of the energy. Now I come to the last part of my presentation, and that's the future. I would say in, in preparation of that, uh, I thought, oh, this is the opportunity for Ukraine to just be an exemplary country in Europe and just go all nice and green um, and uh, make an emphasis on um, uh, solar and wind. And then I gave it some thought. And the thought is Ukraine is going to be pinched for dollars after for, for currency, euros, after this war ends. And as such, the job one is going to be to have abundant and affordable energy. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what uh, we used to call the Paris Hilton solution. Paris Hilton decided to pick up a fight with the late great Senator John McCain in 2008 when McCain ran for president and said, and McCain said, oh, you know, fossil fuels and Paris Hilton. No, no, no. Uh, you know, she, had, she had an energy policy and all of the above. And in the case of Ukraine, it's going to be a Paris Hilton solution, all of the above. It's going to be gas. It's going to be coal if it's economic. It's going to be renewables and, of course, nuclear that will have to be rebuilt. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be one of the biggest rebuilding projects in post-World War II history. The numbers that are thrown around now are between $380 billion to, to a trillion dollars. Uh, it's not going to be a trillion dollars because just you see what's going on in the world. You know, this bank goes out of business. Credit Suisse just got 54 uh, billion, but it's going to be billions and billions of dollars. It probably mostly will have to come from Europe because the U.S. is putting so much money on the war and the Europeans are putting less and Ukraine is in Europe's neighborhood. But uh, to what extent this is going to be green, to what extent it's not going to be green, we will see the biggest challenge I see uh, with uh, um, uh, solar and wind uh, is intermittency. Uh, the wind, <laughs> the wind doesn't always shine, and the sun doesn't always blow. Oops, uh, vice versa. The wind doesn't always blow, and the sun doesn't always shine. So, what do you do at night? What do you do on a day where there's neither, no light and no wind? And the answer is storage, and storage is too expensive. We don't have the technological solution for storage. Yes, you can build more and more capacity and hope that that capacity provides some semblance of a baseline. I think we're not there yet, neither technologically nor economically. So nuclear, gas, coal, um, and when I say gas, uh, um, Morgan mentioned LNG. Uh, I worked on LNG with an Odessa-based company in 2014 in the first war, and we wanted a terminal in Odessa. And of course, Mr. Erdogan, the great ally of the West, said, yuck, no. Uh, and then he referred us to his uh, son-in-law, who was a uh, minister of energy, and said, talk to the boy, and uh, he'll help you. And what the Turks wanted to do, they wanted to have the LNG terminals and then have a pipeline. Uh, into Ukraine, but they would control uh, both the money and the flow of gas. Um, I do believe we can come back uh, to this uh, conversation, especially if Mr. Erdogan is uh, going to build that uh, Erdogan canal uh, bypassing Bosphorus. And that the purpose of that canal is to increase uh, traffic between uh, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And in that traffic, you can bring uh, you should be able to bring in the future LNG tankers that take, take them all the way to Odessa, and that's God willing when the Black Sea will be free from the Russian threat. Uh, so as long as Ukraine wins this war, the future is bright. There'll be a lot of rebuilding and reconstruction opportunity, grid generation, uh, increase of renewables, but not exclusively renewables. And uh, Ukrainian people is one of the most hardworking, talented, uh, and heroic people in the world. And I'm sure uh, they will manage to get the corruption under control, the bureaucracy under control, and rebuild the economy. Uh, if uh, we lose the war, uh, it's uh, 
a scenario I don't want to talk about right now. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much, Errol, uh, for those insights and uh, what's going on. The macroeconomic situation, of course, is very difficult. And as a business association, that's what uh, our major purpose is, is to try to keep Ukraine alive uh, through its business and through its jobs and its income. Uh, and it's and it's difficult uh, in in light of the war. Uh, Andre, and let's go to you and uh, first, uh, give your uh, opinion about what's going on here, and then we want to talk some about what the highest priorities for the Ukraine government should be right now, and actually for the U.S. government because we could help the EU, and uh, there's lots of plans and lots of uh things talked about but we would talk about reality and uh we're most concerned about what ukraine should be doing we all know what they should have been doing in the past which they didn't do uh so uh andre and it's yours thank you so much morgan thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak and thank you so much for all you do to promote ukraine especially now in this uh in this war, uh, terrible war. So uh, regarding Ukraine's energy and its future, uh, sure, Ukraine's energy is among the sectors which suffered the most during the war. Uh, but frankly speaking, a huge share of energy assets were depreciated and old fashioned before the war. So for decades, uh, government postponed this modernization because of populism, because of lack of market reforms, uh, at market approaches because of, uh, in the name of low prices for households, first of all, uh, and some other benefits. So now the situation is different because considering all these losses, uh, the energy asset must be renovated because the economy needs energy. And this gives Ukraine an opportunity, a chance to build an, a new energy sector, modern, efficient, effective, low carbon, so that is a very good window for opportunity for Ukraine. The question only is what should be done and how to be done and when to be done, yeah? Uh, now it's very difficult to um, give an accurate focused what Ukraine's energy will be in the future because there are still uh, too many uncertainty. Like uh, we still, we don't know what will be the damages of the energy sector by the end of the war. Uh, we don't know what will be Ukraine's economy, which defines energy consumption. Uh, we don't know how this economy will fit the, the global economy and how Ukraine's energy sector will fit European energy sector because we're going to be a part of the, the Europe. Uh, but still, there are factors that we understand that these will impact um, renovation and the model design of the future of the energy. And uh, uh, government and civil society and foreign partners may pay attention to these uh, factors today. <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, that uh, Ukraine's European Union aspiration uh, means that the country have to implement European uh, design for energy markets. So, besides regulation, it's about transparency, it's about predictable energy policy, it's about complying to EU climate goals, it's about investor, um, investors' rights protection. So when thinking about uh, future Ukrainian energy sector, we should remember that it should be a part of the European energy. European energy. Uh, the second thing uh, we should, uh, in Ukraine, uh, rethink, with, with, and with, with the help of foreign partners, I, I suppose, we have to rethink uh, the role of the state in the energy sector, uh, in the energy ownership and energy regulation. Because uh, traditionally, uh, for, for many years, uh, we had very big uh, energy companies which dominated in the market, which were unprofitable, uh, which uh, in some cases, which were sources for corrupt rent seeking. In 2014, a new government and new management of the company started the process uh, of transformation, but actually this business, business is um, unfinished. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, so you more than mentioned this monopolies here. So we are uh, under threat of uh, new monopolies, state-owned monopolies, uh, which will be not effective. 
Um, and actually, this process started before the war, and definitely the, the war impacted um, the process because during the war, prices were not much affordable for many people, and the government tried to decrease prices for households, and this burden was put in on the energy state-owned energy companies. So, uh, but when talking about the energy system of the future, we should remember the mistakes of the past. A uh, very good case is Nafta Haas of Ukraine. So when uh, in 2014, Ko Kobolev and Vitrenko team came to Nafta Haas, so they tried to, to change the company, yeah? Uh, but so business is still unfinished. So before the war, we saw the example of how Nafta Gas was trying to acquire uh, cogeneration central heating uh, power plants. Uh, and this process continued in the war. Uh, the, the company has acquired fueling, oil, uh, fueling uh, stations uh, nationalized from Medvedchuk, uh, so it become bigger. Uh, state nationalized uh, private share of Ukrnafta, and Ukrnafta is owned by Nafta Haas, so the company is becoming more bigger. And uh, uh, now Nafta Haas is trying to take control over gas distribution business, and Nafta Haas is a supplier to almost all households. So we are. Uh, we, 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 are, we have a risk of um, going back to the situation when uh, Nafta Haas means uh, gas market, but ineffective. So this is the lesson that we should remember when uh, designing uh, the future of the energy sector. And I mentioned the prices. So uh, we made mistakes in the past because uh, when starting from 2015, when government was, was planning to introduce uh, liberalized markets and uh, market prices, but the process was postponed all the time. Yeah, sure. After the war, affordability of energy prices for for, for utility for utilities general will be a challenge. But we must have an action plan: how and when we will go to market prices for households or uh, or just uh, uh, prices that don't cause losses, and how and when we eliminate. Uh, over regulations and restrictions, price restrictions at uh, wholesale markets and in, in electricity sector, for example. Yeah. So, uh, in the title of uh, our today's uh, discussion, we have reform, European integration, and investment. So, these are bundled. These are bundled. We cannot integrate to the European Union and use energy market uh, without fulfilling comprehensive reforms and complying European energy market design. Uh, reforms by 10 means also transparency, pre predictability of energy policy, market economy with independent energy regulator, uh, but not manual control of the energy markets. So all these and all these factors, all these are conditions for, for investments. And renovation and modernization of the energy sector would be impossible without investments. Uh, it would be a kind of naive logic that uh, renovation of energy um, should be based on international aid. International aid is extremely important, but there will be so many options to use international aid from donors. And uh, um, investments have much more potential to uh, create jobs and to create growth because we will need rapid economic growth. We have lost a uh, huge share of GDP in 2015 and 15. Uh, we are losing a huge share of um, economic growth now. Uh, people are leaving Ukraine. And when we boost economic growth, uh, people who left country even before will be happy to come here, to make to, to build their future here. So uh, we need investments. And investments, to have investments, we need transparent rules predictable policy. And these are preconditions for investors to come here to invest their money. Uh, so this is of crucial importance. And a uh, few uh, more points so about nuclear, about LNG. So regarding LNG, uh, we've been talking in Ukraine about LNG for more than 15 years. And uh, the obstacle was that what Ariel mentioned about uh, the Turkey blocked passing LNG careers through both forests. Uh, from today's perspective, there's another one um, issue that uh, how LNG efforts will correspond with the demand. So uh, what will be the natural gas consumption in Ukraine? Because, because of industry collapsed, we have, um, so the gas consumption uh, has fallen. On the other hand, uh, we do have potential to boost domestic uh, gas production. On the other hand, we have a fascinating potential for biogas. 
uh, as of now, technically, potential for bi biogas production is 10 BCM. That is about 30% of uh, natural gas consumption in recent uh, years. So, and so I think when talking about U Ukraine's energy in the future, uh, we should think uh, not about imports. We should think about uh, at least self-sufficiency or maybe even export. Because if Ukraine's economy becomes more uh, energy efficient, energy, uh, energy efficient, and we boost domestic production of uh, natural gas and bio biogas, uh, we will need no imports. Yeah. Uh, another point regarding nuclear react reactors. So, uh, as you know, Ukraine has a developed uh, nuclear power sector, and in recent almost ten years, almost fifty percent of electricity came from nuclear. And uh, all the time we have a battle in Ukraine. Uh, there is there are a group of people who are supporting nuclear, and there are a group of people who are supporting renewables. Uh, both are good. Sure, uh, uh, sure that renewables are becoming cheaper and cheaper, uh, uh, and we will not have um, the commission of nuclear reactors till uh, 2023. So the question is how many additional nuclear we will need and when. So that is the question. Another question: uh, if we have a serious, because if we have a serious growth on nuclear and serious growth of uh, renewables. Uh, the question will be, what should we do with the surplus of electricity produced? Will domestic industry grow enough to consume this? Will European Union uh, import this electricity? Even now we have some, uh, so technically we can export, e import 2000 megawatts, but we are allowed to do only 700. So that's, that's challenging. But we can think about the energy system of the future. We, sure, we can rebuild. Uh, the economy, we can promote uh, electric transportation in vehicles to, to, to boost uh, electricity consumption and production. Uh, we can uh, shift our centralized heating from coal and gas usage to electricity. We can promote centralized conditioning systems, which means more uh, demand for electricity, not only in winter for heating, but also in summer. Uh, we can use uh, all these uh, heat and cold storages, which are cheaper uh, rather than electricity storages. So, but these are the things that we have to think today. This, we have to, to design options of the future energy system today uh, and to prepare some specific projects for future and to think about what, should, what will be the regulation. The question is, uh, what will be with, with Ukraine's coal? And I think the answer for this question will depend on the damages. Uh, because as of now, 35% of thermal power plants damaged, 30% of um, cogeneration thermal power plants using in, and gas and coal uh, are damaged. Uh, uh, will it be sense to uh, renew coal thermal power generation if all these are destroyed or not? So, uh, that is uh, a question. And uh, I, I just, just a few remarks uh, to uh, that what Ariel uh, said. Uh, uh, the true thing that this uh, fact that for the first time nuclear power plant was used as a military base, I mean, the Parisian nuclear power plant, which is the biggest one in Europe, and uh, so disaster at the nuclear power plant may be a disaster the, for the whole Europe, but I believe that, uh, so, uh, that this, what happened, will change uh, global policy, safety policy on nuclear power plants and policy on planning. Maybe we will have uh, more reasons to go to small modular reactors because of, besides of other benefits they provide, these are smaller. So this means uh, if anything happens, there will be a smaller impact on the power system. And that is a step uh, towards building a decentralized power system, what we need. Uh, and Ukraine really uh, has a great potential for solar and wind, first of all, because of uh, this is a big country. And however, we should remember about the mistakes of planning. We did uh, planning of solar and wind development um, we did in the past. Uh, I think I will stop here to, uh, so, that in, so that we had more, more time for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a few more comments. And uh, my colleague Nadia Komazuk is uh, standing by for the chat window and the questions and answers. Uh, Andrian and Averill, 
one word that always has come up in the last 30 years in energy is uh, probably two words, monopolies and corruption. Uh, to bring in uh, all these new forms of energy or, or new technologies, it's going to take the ability of Western companies to uh, have what we call win-win contracts. And uh, I, uh, we've all watched a whole variety of companies come to Ukraine, kick the tires and go home, or get into some kind of a, of a contract, and then it turns out it's not a win-win contract and they leave. You know, we had all those, uh, I mean, we had ExxonMobil, we had all, all of Shell, we had all those companies out there uh, trying to do work 10, 15 years ago. They all left. Then they came, we all worked hard on production sharing agreements, which make the playing field much more competitive between private companies and the government. The government ended up ruining the production sharing program. It was supposed to be the standard international way that private companies came in. So what did the government of Ukraine do? They let government entities bid on a program that was designed to bring in private companies. And the public companies bid, got one most of them, didn't have the money to implement them. And then when a U.S. company won, they uh, decided they didn't like it. And so they filed lawsuits and figured out a way to destroy it. And uh, so uh, NAFTA gas is uh, very clever about how to keep the private sector out. They're true. Uh, the goal has always been uh, we love the private sector as long as they work for us. Uh, this one company had everything you'd ever need in Ukraine. They filed a lawsuit against the cabinet of ministers saying the competition wasn't fair. Uh, it's just endless what the state companies of Ukraine have done to uh, keep the private sector out. And we all know that where we want the energy sector to go, you're going to have to have the public sector, but you're also going to have to have the private sector. That's not the situation now. We don't see a lot of movement within the government of Ukraine to uh, make the, the uh, situation more competitive, to make it easier to have win-win contracts. And uh, so a few comments about the monopoly situation, because that is one of the main things is keeping private companies out. It has for the last 30 years, and we don't want it to last another 30 years. There's all kinds of opportunities, as you guys say, you can go all kinds of new types of uh, way to get energy and renewable and all kinds of things, but companies aren't going to come in and use their money and produce as long as Ukraine offers them a win-lose situation. Can I uh, just second that, uh, Morgan? Um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, in terms of ancient history, about 20 years ago, um, I was nominated to be the US co-chair for the US-Ukraine Dialogue Economic, uh, US-Ukraine Dialogue Economic Part or Economic Group. I headed the Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian studies at the Heritage Foundation at the time. Um, I can tell you that for 20 years, uh, my colleagues and I felt like a broken record. We kept saying the same thing again and again. Bring the bureaucracy under control, cut corruption, punish corruption, improve the courts. Uh, without that, um, foreign investment doesn't come. Uh, Capital is a coward. It, it wants to come uh, where it is secure and safe and where it can make money. And the second point that uh, Morgan made, uh, I remember being in Kyiv in 2015, dealing with that exact point, the overbearing influence of the state in general and of Naftohaz in particular on the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian gas sector. And uh, investor after investor coming to me and telling me that they are discouraged, um, hurt, abused, and leaving 
And then I did have a friend who was a part of that American consortium that won uh, a bid for gas development. Uh, and I also was aware of uh, both Yulia Tymoshenko as uh, the prime minister and the successor governments trying to mess with American investors uh, offshore and onshore uh, exploration and production in oil and gas. So that track record, I, I don't want to bash Ukraine in the middle of the war, but in terms of lessons learned, I think this is a time to learn this lesson. You cannot uh, punish uh, private investors, keep them away. State companies, uh, there's a huge body of research uh, from the World Bank and elsewhere. State companies do not do as good of a job uh, in oil and gas and in other sectors as private companies that don't have the experience, that don't have the same KPIs. Uh, this is not the way to go to develop your uh, energy sector. Uh, regulation, of course, uh, monitoring, safety, uh, compliance, all these uh, good stuff that state can do and should be doing. Uh, but in terms of exploration and production and being able to make a buck and uh, yes, repatriate profits, um, that is uh, and should be in the hands of the private sector. Okay, uh, one comment then from uh, uh, f uh, from Andre and from about about monopolies because we all know that when you set up monopolies, uh, the output for consumers is always lower, prices are always higher, uh, progress is slower. And then in Ukraine, when you have public monopolies and also private monopolies, that breeds corruption. It, bre it breeds uh, lack of progress. It's just built into the monopoly system. And Ukraine, uh, well, Andre, and then we'll go to some of these questions here. We got to get to the heart of the question. What can Ukraine do today? What can its neighbors do uh, to... Uh, to keep you keep getting Ukraine on the right path and energy, of course, is so critical to winning the war, but also uh, to keeping the economy going. Andrian, thank you, thank you, Marco. That's true. That's true. Think about the monopolies, and I cannot uh, sure I agree with what that what Ariel said that uh, the war is a very sensitive period to comment um, energy policy or some other economic policies. Uh, and sure that the wartime uh, requires to make some changes, temporary changes to economic policy, energy policy. But we should remember that after the war, we have to go back to the track of uh, European integration in energy. So which means to implement all these reforms uh, to become uh, closer to European energy markets models, and uh, that's why uh, implementing some changes today, we have to do this to that extent in order to do less changes in future. So to, to make less harm as possible. However, so I understand that uh, the, the key priority of money spending is, is arming in, in, in the country. Uh, but uh, totally, I totally agree without uh, the monopolies. Sure, we should distinguish monopolies that there are natural monopolies, which so you, you cannot bring competition to this market. But in this case, you have a, a regulator body which should control. And this body, according to European principles, should be independent. And that happened that um, uh, even energy community uh, claims that uh, energy regulator is now as a body of uh, or, um, similar to ministry, so it's not independent. So we should we should change this. So a uh, specific energy regulator should control these companies, but uh, state should provide conditions to make these companies uh, profitable. So I remember two thousand, uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, there was uh, an amendment of regulation uh, for. Um, uh, tariff for pricing for uh, distribution electricity. Uh, so uh, that was a good step. But the, the, such steps should be done in not only in electricity, 
And in the case of uh, other uh, sectors of markets where competition may exist, sure, we should uh, move forward to competition. And in 2015, when new management of NAFTA gas came, uh, so that they had very ambitious plans about splitting companies, about going to IPO, uh, um, about new investors. Uh, on some reason, at some moment, we saw a shift in state's policy. We, uh, we, we saw a turn towards um, concentration, so establishing big, big companies. And uh, that is the lesson we uh, shouldn't forget uh, that in 2014, government decided to uh, turn NAFTA gas, which was a black hole for the state coffers, turn to effective, profitable, different companies. Uh, so we, we shouldn't go back. We shouldn't go back uh, because this will undermine our uh, our investments. Uh, but again, so it's, it, the, the, this issue is very sensitive uh, during the wartime. But we we and we should conduct changes. But in order to to make less harm for the energy sector in in the nearest future after after the victory. Okay, uh, Nadia, I think there's quite a few questions about. Uh, renewable energy. There's some of them debating questions between themselves. Let's get them out here. Uh, what? What? Uh, let's get some of the port, important ones out. What do you want to tell us? Uh, uh, it's going on the chat line. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for participating in the discussion. Uh, yeah, there are several um, topics for discussion, and let's start with the green energy. Anastasia Zhukova is asking a question, and several people support her in asking that. So, hello, thank you for the interesting conversation. My question is, if Ukraine has enough expertise to transition its energy sector to green, what are the uh, perspectives to export green energy from Ukraine to EU, as the demand has been growing rapidly there? Well, I just uh, want to say that um, uh, when you say green energy, uh, the most advanced technologies right now is wind uh, and solar. Uh, just look at the map and check. Uh, uh, Ukraine is not uh, in North Africa. It's not Uzbekistan that have 360 days out of 365 with sun. Uh, so solar would not be the most um, the most uh, effective and efficient uh, way to do it. Uh, wind, I don't know enough about the wind map of Ukraine. Maybe Adrian uh, can fill it. But both uh, sources are intermittent. And uh, unless you have uh, a very effective, cost-effective storage, uh, you do not have that supply uh, as a base load, as something that you can turn on, turn off, and is readily uh, and abundantly and cheaply available. So I think Ukraine now is what, either an eight or nine percent, uh, not counting hydro, uh, is solar and wind, if that, maybe less, um, and maybe several more percentage points. But I do not see for the next 20 years without storage being really cheap. Uh, today's storage is mostly lithium ion batteries that are very expensive. And then people are tinkering with some other technologies, you know, getting water up uh, to a reservoir and then water goes down and rotates a turbine. Um, so the storage is, is a challenge. And also you need a grid that is much more modernized, much more nimble than the early 20th century grid uh, that in some cases a hundred or plus, hundred or more years old. So the grids that were built for coal uh, and then switched to gas and nuclear are not the same grids as you need for the renewables. Andrian, any comments from you? Yeah, um, I do have a couple. So regarding expertise uh, and about potential to expert. Uh, well, uh, Ukraine do have expertise, enough expertise, and besides, so Ukrainian and, and business is a good promoter uh, of this expertise, and uh, uh, governmental body do have all this 
meetings with energy community, with different agencies. So this expertise is improving. Uh, but, you know, sometimes something goes wrong. For example, uh, Ukraine had this uh, national election plan for renewables still until 2020. And this stipulated that uh, solar and, um, and wind will grow at the similar extent. Uh, but in fact, uh, so uh, so if I'm not wrong, so we plan to have 2,000 megawatt of solar uh, and two, about 2,000 wind. In fact, we had six gigawatt of solar and a little bit less than one of wind. And uh, this happened because uh, on the one hand, uh, so fitting tariff for solar was higher. And on the other hand, <laughs> there was no mechanism uh, to, to stop uh, allowing these constructions. Um, regarding the, uh, so uh, before the invasion, so as a, if I'm not wrong, as a result of 2021, 13% uh, of electricity in Ukraine came from renewables. And we remember that we have a huge uh, nuclear power sector. So uh, to a huge extent, Ukrainian was carbon neutral and uh, Ukraine couldn't export a lot of electricity to Europe where there is a demand for positive electricity because most of part of Ukraine was integrated to Russia and Belarus. And so today is the first anniversary that Ukrainian power system totally is integrated to Europe. Uh, we do have some restrictions because technically our capacity allows to import or export 2000 megawatts uh, capacity, uh, 2000 megawatt capacity. But uh, there are technical restrictions because NCE, uh, that's an organization uniting transmission system operators of European countries, now they allow us to import or export, export only 700. Yeah. So this was challenging uh, in winter when we experienced very different uh, periods uh, after air attacks, air strikes. And uh, this may be challenging Ukraine now because. As uh, um, spring comes, uh, we will have a lot of um, power generation from solar and we will have some um, more potential to export electricity uh, and, and money. Uh, uh, regarding wind power today, so about 90% of wind power capacity is allocated in the territories which are not controlled, uh, temporarily not controlled. All these facilities are uh, broken. Just to remind that about 68% of all wind power capacities installed in Ukraine are allocated in Zaporizhia and Kherson oblasts. Uh, but we are anticipating that uh, Russian troops withdrew from the Zaporizhia region. Uh, so I have I have reasons to, to for such a hope. Uh, then uh, I, I think so. So this um, sometimes it happens that uh, there are some mistakes in uh, Ukraine's regulation. Intentional or not intentional. So uh, that is the thing. Uh, so that's that's the question about expertise and uh, potential. So th th these are the things that we have to deal with. So we have to think about uh, the best result for the whole sector, okay. but not for some actor. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, when you look, when you uh, seems like we we talked about. Uh, business conditions and win-win contracts. When you look back, we all would know that Ukraine's had a lot more energy uh, that it could have produced than it did. A lot of people talk like in the last 30 years, Ukraine's produced maybe half of what it could or 40% of what it could because of uh, not the right business conditions. Why do we have there's a lot of technology out there. Ukraine has a lot of good people. Ukraine has resources. Ukraine has uh, could have done a lot more, but it was monopolies. It was uh, corruption. It was all kinds of things that restricted Ukraine. So you could talk about whether you want to do it this way or whether you want to do it that way or you want to do it some other way. The bottom line always is Ukraine could have taken care of this energy. Ukraine could have. Uh, produce a lot more. They can do that today, but why not? Because they don't set up, they don't set up competitive conditions, and they don't set up win-win contracts. It doesn't really have a lot to do with technology. It doesn't have a lot to do with what, whether Ukraine has access to energy supplies. It doesn't have to do with all this academic and 
all that kind of stuff. It has to do with the fact that international businesses cannot do business in Ukraine, and the business environment is terrible for you, Ukraine companies. So let's talk about nuclear for a while. Ukraine set up an amazing nuclear system. Then, uh, of course, when independence came, uh, most of the people in the nuclear industry had been trained in Russia, and Russia had a monopoly on selling nuclear fuel to Ukraine, and they had a monopoly on buying the waste back. Ukraine, for probably almost 30 years, was spending two, three hundred million a year paying Russia to take their their uh, nuclear waste because Ukrainian government wouldn't wouldn't build a nuclear waste facility, and there were private companies ready to build it. Also, they were buying 100% of their fuel from Russia. Then comes along the U.S. government and Westinghouse. They built the first nuclear fuel that would work in Soviet reactors, built it in the West. So finally, with the strength of the U.S. government and Westinghouse, the U.S. government, the uh, Ukraine government gave Westinghouse about 45% of the business. And the only one good thing that came out of the war is finally, finally, Ukraine quit buying nuclear fuel from, from uh, Russia. Now they don't buy any. Up until the war, they were buying 55, 60% of their fuel from Russia. Why do that? Now, with the U.S. government financing help through private companies and uh, and Holtec, they now finished a nuclear fuel waste facility, storage facility in Ukraine. So there's been a lot of progress in nuclear, in setting up a nuclear waste facility and uh, cutting back the dependence on Russian fuel. And Westinghouse is talking to uh, to uh, Niagara Able that try to get some more reactors going, which are long run projects. And then you got this new technology. The problem is the government sets the price of fuel of energy to the consumer so low that, and there go Adam, can't make any money. No company survives and can invest in new technology and do what it needs to do and build new facilities when the government forces them to operate almost at cost. So the, the future of the nuclear industry is being severely damaged and limited again by the, by the government of Ukraine. And uh, they're getting way behind in remodeling the, the uh, reactors they have, bringing them up to speed, increasing the capacity and the deal. So again, it comes back to the business environment. It comes back to being able to sign reliable, long-term win-win contracts. And I know, uh, and I know Errol knows, it, it was not a very good process, but a company got an offshore agreement. The minute they got the offshore agreement, like in the Soviet days, if you get an agreement, the person on one side always says the other side won. And Yulia Timoshenko immediately got up and said, we're giving away the crown jewels of Ukraine because they signed this one offshore contract. You know, two or three, four or five hundred million dollars after you get a contract and the well could be dead. It was all a political deal. They set up a deal to improve and, and go offshore. Then the government of Ukraine destroyed it. Then they set up production sharing agreements to bring in the private sector. And then they destroyed it. So every time there's been a major effort to set up win-win contracts in Ukraine, the government talks, 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 and once they get them set up, then they destroy them. So the question is, again, through the war and into the future, are we going to have uh, win-win contracts? Are we going to have a hospitable business environment? I can tell you that lots of companies would like to come in and develop energy in Ukraine. They're sitting at the door. Most of the best ones came in, kicked the tires and left and never invested. The others came in and invested. Two years later, they left. Their contracts were all messed up by the government of Ukraine. And we're not being, I don't know, we're not particularly being negative as, as uh, Errol said, we're trying to be honest here. We're trying to be uh, upfront. 
we're trying to talk what in reality and not fantasy land. Uh, so as we uh, close down today, let's talk again about the future. Uh, both of you, what's the two things you think the government of Ukraine should do? Or two or three most important? What do you think Europe should do? What could the United States do? It's going to take Europe and the United States and, and Ukraine to solve this energy problem. It's not going away. And uh, it's the energy problem for the region. It's the energy problem for Ukraine. And there's answers uh, to all of those problems. And the biggest answer has always been for the government of Ukraine with the EU and United States to set up a hospitable environment for private companies. There's plenty of room out there for NAFTA gas and all the state companies. They don't have to squeeze everybody else out. That's a win, that's a lose, lose, lose transaction. That's what they've been doing. They promote lose, lose transactions except for themselves. And then they limit production. And the people of Ukraine get shafted once again. Uh, so let's just talk about for a few minutes what's something realistic that Ukraine can do during the war here and what more can EU and the United States do to help Ukraine and the region. Energy is such an important issue and it gets messed up so many times because it's profitable, it's monopolistic and uh, you know all the problems, but most of it is business and over government regulation. Okay. Go ahead, Errol. Uh, Andrea, you want to start? Uh, if you want, so you can do. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Morgan, very good questions. Very good questions, very good points. And I'm not sure that I know a simple answer. So regarding uh, uh, why this happened, so I have a theory that uh, populism, and uh, paternalism are where and are among the key enemies uh, of energy reforms in Ukraine in the recent three decades, the same as uh, a search for private interest in an illegal way, uh, what, what we call corruption. Uh, and uh, the problem is that revolution in mind can happen very short because in, uh, in what day we had to shift from common economy to market economy. And there was no understanding that people have to pay market price. And government did understand at that moment this too. And then uh, government got, got into the trap that, okay, guys, we will provide you cheap price and you will provide us um, your votes. Uh, in, uh, um, but the situation is improving. Situation is improving. And uh, I would say that it partly improved after the Orange Revolution. It also improved after the Revolution of Dignity, especially he went in 2014, Gazprom threatened Ukraine with cutting, cutting gas supplies and government was, that was really trying to do, uh, to take good steps, uh, very good steps to change the situation. Unfortunately, in two years, they saw the situation is okay and they had, they started thinking about, um, about political loyalty, uh, about for, for, from, from the side of voters. Uh, so th that's why uh, I think uh, I don't have an easy answer uh, for this, but that is about serious change, a little bit change of social country, uh, that people in Ukraine have to understand that uh, we cannot uh, receive energy, utility services as granted as for free. And government should change their attitude. We should introduce succession to, to policies, to economic policy. If... Uh, if one president or prime minister uh, mm, signs some uh, action plan for the next 10 or 20 years, we should keep to this action plan and change it only in an emergency case. So I, I think we, uh, uh, in Ukraine, we have to think how to make all the system uh, predictable, I mean, environment, business environment predictable so that any investor knew that when he comes here in 10 years, he will have the same good um, conditions. Uh, now we have talks in Ukraine about uh, increasing utility prices. So uh, 
people partly understood what is the price for, for, for energy when they had these cutoffs. Uh, uh, I'm sure that we will not see a real price, uh, but uh, so in 2015, we had this potential increase. So we have to do this uh, in the moment when people didn't forget all the problems of the energy system. And I, I have a hope that this will impact in a good way the people's attitude about the necessity to pay a real price. Uh, you know, when we don't didn't want to pay a real price for gas uh, in 1983, because of Masandro agreements, we lost huge part of the Crimea fleet. In 2014, we uh, lost Crimea. All the time, that is about um, not trading is to pay market price for, for resources. So we have to forget this. And so, but sure, that this, this process is not, um, can be done quickly, but I hope that uh, current situation, the country will contribute to improving of this uh, understanding. Uh, uh, it's maybe- Okay, uh, yeah. okay let's, uh, yeah. so before we get let's, to Eric, look, another yeah. time, Nadia ask another question. We got some good questions up there. How much time do we have left, uh, Morgan? Well, we got 15 minutes if okay. we want to take it. Yeah, go ahead, Nadia. We'll take 15 more minutes. Nadia, we got 54 chat questions. Uh, yeah, there has been discussion going on in the chat line about the nuclear facilities and uh, several people are asking what can uh, the US and its allies in Europe do to safeguard nuclear facilities in the war zone? And uh, we have debates regarding the second part of this question, can a diplomatic solution be reached to keep the reactors immune from attacks by Russia? Uh, I've uh, spoken about this topic at um, a big uh, conference with pretty senior people in Paris in the end of November. Um, I should uh, be publishing something about it, but the bottom line is this. Um, if this was a war between small and significant powers, countries, it would be one thing. Unfortunately, one of the five nuclear powers is involved in that, and it is the one that is breaking the status quo. It's Russia. Uh, it's paradoxical because Russia is one of the greatest exporters of nuclear reactors and nuclear fuel, and they are, um, as always, or as often, are uh, cutting uh, the branch that they're sitting on. They uh, destroyed their own hydrocarbon market in Europe. That was the big moneymaker for them. And now they're destroying potentially uh, the nuclear industry that also they were a big player. Uh, having said that, I think this is one of these areas that we need to talk to China about uh, because China, uh, Japan, and others are interested in the nuclear um, industry development. And more specifically, I would say that um, in Ukraine, uh, the waste, the nuclear waste can and should be reprocessed either in Ukraine itself. You build uh, a breeder reactor that reprocesses the waste fuel. We don't have it uh, in this country, but the French uh, know how to do it. The Russians know how to do it. Um, and secondly, uh, we need to recognize, uh, Adrian said that the Ukrainian reactors are good till, what, 2040, you said? Um, starting from 2030, we have to decommission. Yeah, but these reactors, remember, were built by the Soviet um, Minatom, the Ministry of Nuclear uh, Energy and Nuclear Power, is what's called the Minister of Media Machine Building, uh, to make it secret. Uh, it was built in the 1960s, uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s. These reactors are getting old, and we need to start thinking, including in Ukraine, about new technologies, small and medium modular reactors that are safer and that can be dispersed uh, and less dangerous. So instead of having 10 large um, expensive reactors, we can have 30 smaller, safer reactors that are contained uh, systems that do not require a lot of service. 
you basically bring them, install, plug in into the grid and they work. Uh, so that's another thing in terms of modernization and rebuilding after the war we can think about. Uh, finally, uh, just to hammer the point that Morgan was making earlier, I hope after the war, uh, working uh, more closely, working together with American and European uh, policymakers, regulators, private sector companies, uh, et cetera, we will have a different investment climate in Ukraine. I do not hold my breath, uh, investment climate is often a function of uh, a cultural mindset, if you wish, a culture of um, uh, openness uh, or lack thereof, of corruption or less thereof. And it will be a challenge uh, to prevent the uh, government um, officials and bureaucrats to uh, block the development uh, of private sector based um, hydrocarbon industry in Ukraine, but I really hope that after the war, there'll be such a huge uh, mindset shift um, that it will be done. And by the way, I would add, yeah, Adrian, I, I'll, I'll let you speak in a second. I would add that uh, maybe we should start thinking about how you write the rules for investment and re, um, revise and re-examine the institutions, the regulatory institutions uh, for investment as a condition of the Western assistance. So you say you shrink the ability of government companies to be involved themselves in exploration and production as a condition for our assistance in rebuilding Ukrainian energy sector after the war. Just one short comment, comment to avoid somebody from uh, our guests um, treated uh, some of your words in the wrong way. So I just have to, to say that existing in Ukraine nuclear reactors are maintained well and International uh, Atomic Energy Agency controls the process. Uh, so uh, these are safe uh, in terms of PC usage. But sure, I agree that we have to think about small modular reactors, which are uh, progressive technology and which are more safe by default. Yep. Now, another one question before we close. Another hot question. Um, a question to Ariel um, regarding his comments about large generators difficult to transport. Are they still needed? If so, what capacities and what kind of organizations need them? That's from Tatiana Tavliui. Uh, Pani Tatiana, I was looking into that about three weeks ago and they were needed. Um, they are, I think, up to one megawatt. Uh, uh, Adrian, help me out. How, how, what is the capacity of the large generators, is it up to one megawatt? Uh, there are, uh, if we're talking the about ones. Uh, there are even more, there are even much more. But we had also the problem with transformers, with high voltage transformers, which were attacked by Russian missiles, and uh, not so many countries used them. And uh, there is a serious deficit to, to be produced, a deficit uh, to be used as a spare parts. So th that was another one uh, serious problem. Andrian, there is a question to you with respect to the nuclear energy. Where does Ukraine source its radioactive raw materials, uranium, et cetera? Uh, what, what means source? Uh, st stores? No, uh, where so does where Ukraine source? Uh, you mean where nuclear fuel is stored? Not stored, originates. Stored. Uh, where does it buy? Where is well, it imported from? Since the invasion, Ukraine didn't import any uh, nuclear fuel from Russia, and that was a decision made uh, by government not to, not to import any more uh, nuclear fuel. But before the invasion, so you had, Ukraine had uh, huge stocks of nuclear fuel to operate for about a year. And so as Western Gauss was an important uh, supply of nuclear fuel, so now Ukraine uh, is going to import from 
from Westinghouse, and also there are talks about to um, about building a factory to fabricate, not not produce, fabricate nuclear fuel. So which means that we just take enriched uranium and uh, just compose these assembles, uh, which then are used by nuclear power units. And since you uh, mentioned about storing, there is a question um, from Dmitry Kalmykov. Does Ukraine consider to build underground uh, repositories for spent nuclear fuel and radioactive waste as it is case of France and Finland, or do such facilities already exist in Ukraine? Uh, well, uh, the existing storage is on the ground, but uh, so uh, volume of concrete makes this uh, this this uh, facility as well is true very strong. So officially, there was no information about uh, plans to construct underground uh, storage, but uh, there were announced plans to, to discussions about intentions to plant underground. Uh, tra transforming uh, substations, which which were under attack during the war. Voltec just finished the uh, their large nuclear fuel waste facility on behalf of the government of Ukraine. It's above ground. It's in their the best uh, world class uh, steel containers that that are available in the world today. It's up to date. And it's modern. It's the first time Ukraine doesn't have to ship their nuclear fuel waste to. Uh, to Russia. So as we begin to close, uh, just one quick note about my experience, uh, particularly in gas and oil. Ariel, I've probably uh, sat down with uh, 10 large international energy companies. They, uh, I'd say five of them came to Ukraine for a year, kicked tires, talked to everybody came back and said, Morgan, we like Ukraine, we love Ukraine, but we're not gonna invest any money there. I met with three or four of them with prime ministers. They told prime ministers, we can do in one year what your NAFTA gas takes three years. We have all the money you need. We have all the technology you need. We have all the, the uh, human capital that you need. We're ready to come to Ukraine uh, please uh, set up a production credit system so you can have international standards and take uh, um, legal problems to international courts. They all said, yeah, we need to do that. So five companies came and invested and then left. The other five came and said, no, we're not going to invest there. That doesn't have to be that way. That can be changed. This all can be changed by the the uh, business environment. Ukraine has what it needs. Ukraine can be energy sufficient. They can export energy. They can do all of this if they had a better business environment. And instead of it, what is what is it? 80, 70, 80 percent controlled by government companies. It's a, the energy and the uh, oil and gas. Well, of course, nuclear is. So the, the uh, energy system is totally dominated by government. And uh, we need something where there's 60% private and 40% government. Right now it's probably 70, 30 or 80, 20. Uh, that's not getting the job done. So uh, final comments from you, Errol. My final comments uh, are that these are the precarious times that people who are the leaders and the managers of our security have to address the security issues, whereas the economic leaders have to address the future of the Ukrainian economy and of the Ukrainian energy. Uh, clearly, this is an opportunity to build the Ukrainian economy uh, for the 21st century. This is a time where the Soviet and post-Soviet most problematic legacies and practices can be left in the past. And uh, Ukraine can look at the uh, leading examples, good examples of um, most advanced uh, economy and most advanced energy sector. And by that, I don't only mean uh, oil and uh, I don't only mean uh, solar and wind because uh, 
uh, for example, after the investment of 400 billion euros, Germany is generating something like 5% uh, only uh, from uh, wind and solar. So you need to look at a broader picture. And as Morgan pointed out, you need to allow Western companies to come in and um, prospect for oil and gas and exploit uh, the resources, uh, both for the internal Ukrainian market and for the external market. Uh, you have a situation in Europe where Germany and other countries with the predominance of the green lobby are perfectly fine importing electricity from nuclear, from coal, from other countries, but they will not allow this in their backyard. Maybe this is an opportunity for Ukraine. Uh, people mentioned in the chat that you, know, you should put energy facilities outside of the Ukrainian borders. For now, in a temporary, um, in a temporary fashion, maybe uh, you can put it in Poland and elsewhere, just import electricity from Poland. But in the longer term, with the Ukrainian industrial capacity, Ukraine uh, did and can uh, export energy to Europe in the future. And I hope and pray that it will be in the position to do it sooner rather than later. Thank you so much. Adrian, your final comment. Thank you. Uh, just one comment that it's impossible to locate uh, facilities in Poland and to use electricity from there because you still need transmission uh, and losses will be enormous. But uh, I totally agree that this, um, this situation uh, opened for Ukraine a window of opportunities to, to rebuild its energy sector and rebuild its economy. And uh, however, this reconstruction, renovation shouldn't be just material. It should be about regulation as well. And finally, uh, we have to come to this understanding that uh, um, economic growth needs investments and investments need uh, predictable, uh, transparent policy uh, and predictable, transparent markets. And uh, state regulation cannot uh, misuse uh, its uh, leverages, pressuring energy companies, pressuring their normal margins, uh, normal profits. So uh, that is uh, that actually what all here in Ukraine we should do. Uh, and uh, all in Ukraine are great, grateful to the United States of America, to Western donors for all the support uh, you did. And, uh, and sure, uh, that would be very good if uh, U.S. shared its expertise uh, about uh, this transition to, to this market economy. Well, I don't have easy answers, uh, but I understand what direction should we move, and we don't have much time to do this because, because of all these losses of the economy we had in the recent decade. Okay, thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. And I'd like to say that uh, we all believe in Ukraine. We all know they've got the resources to build a strong country. We all know that uh, it's going to take uh, international partners, international business with Ukraine business and with the Ukraine government moving in, in the right direction. And we all know that the number for the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council and everybody else, the number one issue for 2023, throw out Putin now, get rid of him. And number two, set up all the plans needed to rebuild Ukraine. So we have plenty to do. It can be done. Ukraine can be free. It can be a strong, independent country in the world. It can be done. Let's throw out Putin and rebuild Ukraine. Okay, full speed ahead. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Slava.